And today we are focusing on some of the most vulnerable people in the UK, uh, who through no fault of their own, uh, over the past year have been plunged into debt uh, because of this pandemic crisis. I am immensely grateful to Hannah Brown, uh, JPIC Campaigns and Church Engagement Officer, for assembling this excellent panel who she's about to introduce herself and, 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 and chair um, in a moment. Um, but just before I hand over to Hannah, could I just request that we all remain on mute so that we can improve the sound quality. This workshop is being recorded so that others can enjoy it uh, from the HeartEdge Facebook page after this event. And there will be an opportunity at the end of the panel time for your questions and your comments and your thoughts. So please do um, post in the chat your questions and comments and I will come to you um, at that time. Uh, just ask you to unmute and make your comment, make your question at that time. If you wish for me to ask your question for you, then just make that clear in the chat. Um, but uh, I am hugely grateful to our panelists who are uh, many of whom busy ministers and, and it's just wonderful that they have given up this time to, to share in this way. So over to Hannah. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. It's really lovely to be with you all this afternoon. Um, as Catherine said, um, I work for um, the Methodist Church as part of the Joint Public Issues team. And the Joint Public Issues team brings together um, the Methodist Church, the United Reformed Church, the Baptist Union and the Church of Scotland to work together around issues of peace and justice. And we're going to spend a bit of time this afternoon thinking about how the issue of household debt has been particularly impacted by COVID-19 um, and the consequences of the lockdowns and how churches have been acting in response to that through the Reset the Debt campaign. And we'll have some time for a question and discussion at the end. So we're really pleased to have a panel of speakers um, with us this afternoon that um, we'll have a conversation together over the next sort of half an hour, 40 minutes or so. Um, we've got Paul Morrison with us. Paul is policy advisor for the Joint Public Issues team uh, and the lead writer on the Reset the Debt report. And Paul's going to be speaking to us um, a little bit about the, the growing poverty and inequality in the UK, um, which led to the campaign and the kind of policy response from the government that Reset the Debt is calling for. Uh, we've got Reverend Mike Long with us. Mike is a minister for Notting Hill Methodist Church and Mike's PhD is in the theology of Jubilee. And he's going to speak to us a little bit later on about what the theology of Jubilee might be speaking to us in, in this particular moment of recovery and rebuilding from the pandemic. We've got the Reverend Bev Bowden with us. Bev um, works at Aldridge uh, Methodist Church and supports Abelwell Advice, a church-led financial advice centre in Warsaw. And she's going to speak to us a little bit about the impact of COVID-19 on the community that they serve. And we've got the Reverend Cassius Francis with us as well. Cassius is the Just Finance Worker for Transforming Communities Together and a minister in the Wesleyan Holiness Church. Cassius leads on the COVID cash recovery course and is going to speak to us a little bit about the practical and policy responses that the church could be making to address some of these rising household debt issues. So before we um, dig into some of that, I'm just going to share a very short video with you to introduce the Reset the Debt campaign and some of the stories behind it. Leonie had been doing shift work through an agency for several years, but her work ended when lockdown began. She has no recourse to public funds and is now behind on her rent, water bills and her council tax. Every day, she receives letters asking for repayment. Andre approached a church-based advice centre after he ended up sleeping on the street when his work as an Uber driver suddenly dried up and his debts became unmanageable. Leanne is living in fear of eviction as the part-time work she did to make ends meet stopped in lockdown and she wasn't able to pay her rent and bills. People who were previously able to keep their heads above water are now in severe difficulty. Others, who had only just been staying afloat, now face being overwhelmed by circumstances entirely outside of their control. We need a jubilee. We need to reset the debt. So I'd love to invite Bev um, now to speak with us. Um, Bev, could you describe to us a little bit about the context that you live and work in? 
Yeah, of course, Hannah. Um, I am a minister at a Methodist church in Walsall, um, which for those of you who don't know, is about 15 miles north of Birmingham. And Walsall is actually a very diverse um, community. Um, we are a population of around 295,000 and 75% white British, and then a whole multitude of different ethnicities uh, making up the rest of the population. And as um, a borough, we are in the most deprived 10% in the country. But within that, we have pockets of the area um, where I minister in Aldridge is a more affluent area. So that statistic kind of really hides some of the real in-depth poverty that there is. So one in three children are living in poverty um, in Warsaw, which is a really sobering statistic. Absolutely. And what has the, the impact of COVID-19 been on your community, particularly financially? Well, in um, Warsaw, it's had quite an impact on um, jobs and people going on to furlough. So in terms of jobs, the biggest impact is on part time workers, um, especially women and in the, those in the 16 to 24 age group where they've either lost their jobs completely or have been furloughed. And we, what we found, we've been um, operating as a money and debt advice centre for um, almost 10 years now. And we also have a food bank and a job club as well. And what we have found in the last three to four years is people are struggling, really struggling, people in work um, as well as people out of work. So it used to be the case people would come and their, their debt had got out of hand, but they had some spare income that could help to restructure the debts and actually put into place a payment plan to pay them off. What we found over the last two years especially is that the, the gap between people's outgoings and people's incomings means that they're in a negative position. So you throw into that COVID, you throw into that people going on to furlough on reduced income or people not having as much overtime as they were used to and suddenly their outgoings become totally unmanageable, um, which is really, really difficult for people. Yeah, and then talk a little bit about Everwell then. What sort of responses Everwell offer to, to those people that you're serving? Well, we very quickly made sure that we changed um, the way we do things to make us COVID secure. Um, so we moved all of the debt and money advice from face to face advice to telephone advice, but we were able, luckily we had a lot of volunteers who were still able to come in, we were able to keep the food bank open. And to start with, we saw a huge surge in need for the food bank until the schools got sorted out with the food banks and everything for families and then that eased off a little bit. Um, we have also been able to help the schools. So we've partnered with schools, um, helping and supporting the most vulnerable families. So at Christmas, we have breakfast packs that went out to over 600 pupils across three different schools. We've done the same at half term and we'll just be packing next week ready for Easter packs as well. So it's just things to try to make life a little bit easier for people really. So the food bank has been really, really busy. Um, and um, we've also managed to secure some funding to employ a trainee advisor because we can just see that the need for advice is just going to absolutely balloon in the coming months. I think some of the measures that the government have put in place, like the additional £20 a week on universal credit, have really helped and have just plugged that gap for many people. But when that is removed, I think the floodgates are going to open. And of course, there's been other things happening. So creditors haven't been allowed to pursue debts in the same way they normally would. The actions of bailiffs have been suspended as well and evictions have been suspended. But I just feel that's just storing, storing up what's going to happen for the future. And when I've spoken to some of the projects to ours, we're very close with a project that works across the former mining communities in um, Derbyshire and up into Sheffield and Nottinghamshire. They are having the same experience that they just feel the demand for debt advice is just going to absolutely balloon in the next, next few months. So there's a lot of a lot of issues out there just bubbling under the service that just one more thing is just going to knock people into a position where they just can't recover. Mm. And you started to touch on it there a little bit. There. Sorry, a bit of feedback there, but if you started to touch on it a little bit there, but from where you sit right now, kind of looking ahead to our roadmap out of lockdown, the things that the government have been talking about, what do you see the future looking like for the community that you're sitting within? I think it's it's difficult to tell. I work in business as well, alongside being a minister um, part time. And um, I work in an umbrella organisation with 40 different independently owned businesses all across the country. And the fortunes of, of businesses, it's really difficult 
they really don't know at the moment. They're trying to hold on to staff as much as they can through the furlough scheme, but nobody mm -hmm. knows what's going to happen, whether demand's going to pick up, whether they'll be able to then keep those people in full-time employment. So it seems as if there's a whole load of unknowns which could really dramatically change the face of things um, in the next few months. So I think that the assistance the government has been able to give has really helped business, but there's an awful lot of worried people, I think, as to whether they will have a job to go back to. And I think the, the saddest thing is just like in the video, um, there's people that we've been working with for quite some time who had managed to get on top of their debts, who had got payment plans in process and were just about managing. And this has come along and suddenly furlough losing that 20% of income or um, one partner being um, uh, laid off. It's just those people that had worked so hard, it's just tipped them into debt again. And of course, it's it's not just the financial impact, it's the emotional impact on people and their total well-being. Um, mm -hmm. So yes, it's, it's not good to see at all. And so reset the debt, highlighting that challenge, but also about thinking about what transformation for that situation would look like. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about Jubilee and kind of the proposals around that in a second. But for you, what would change or Jubilee look like for your community? I think it would just be almost that sense of relief that there's somebody there that's actually going to help me. <clears throat> Excuse me, there's somebody that understands that actually this is not of my making, that I was doing the very best that I could. Um, and it's just come as a total curveball. And just I think if people could see a way out, I think the trouble is at the moment people are seeing that actually they have got so much that they owe that's been caused not through their own doing that's arisen because of COVID that they can't see a way out and I think actually if they knew that this um, reset the debt was there it's just a fresh start and it's just some hope for them and um, you know that's what we want to give that's what God's all about is bringing hope to people and that's what I think the reset the debt campaign will do. And it seems like a drop in the ocean when you look at the billions that's being spent elsewhere. This is a small sum of money in comparison um, that could have such a massive impact on so many people who are at the lowest end of our society. And I think we've just seen that gap between the rich and the poor get wider and wider and wider. And all of the issues around social mobility, um, everything that people been, have been working for just seems to be swept aside. And I think something like this would actually help to bring some of that parity back. Thank you, Bev. It's really useful to start this conversation rooted in what some of the lived experience of people at that community level that I imagine a lot of us will be embedded within as well um, can, can start. Yeah, and it's, it's just some things. We've got a lady who's 68 who has just got the basic state pension who hasn't got enough to live off, who was doing market research. Well, of course, all of that stopped. So she sits there at 68 thinking, how on earth am I ever going to get myself out of this? And she's had to use a credit card and her debt is built just to cover everyday bills and um, it's people like that that it's just they are weighed down by the birds. Mm. I'd like to to bring in Paul now, Paul Morrison. And um, Paul's gonna speak with us a little bit about kind of how what Bev's just been speaking to from, from communities in Warsaw has been reflected on kind of a national scale or across the things we've we've seen elsewhere. Um, Paul, how has what Bev has described that been reflected elsewhere? I think essentially what Bev is describing can be seen across the country. The, when, when lockdown started, we did a, a series of focus groups and we did essentially, it's a grand name for conversations of an evening with community leaders around the country asking what was happening in their community. And there were two messages we got really clearly. The first was a real fear for tomorrow is, is the food bank going to cope or, or do we have enough volunteers? Can we make sure we support the vulnerable people we know are around? But when Bev mentioned that a Jubilee would bring sort of relief, it was there was another sense of this thing of debt slowly building up. There was a knowledge that lots of people could only put food on the table by delaying paying a bill or by putting it onto a credit card when they really didn't want to, or by not paying their rent. And that, and that feeling that we knew this was how people were coping during the, during the lockdown period grew and grew and grew. And that's, why, and that's why we ended up talking about debt because we felt that that was the thing that was gonna hold communities back whenever the lockdown ended and we started to try rebuild 
our economy and rebuild society. Yeah. Sorry, just the other thing that I think would be really important to say is what is, again, what Bev referred to was that people were having negative incomes so that their outgoings are more than their incomings. And that has been growing over the past decade that many people cannot possibly budget, even if they're in work, wages are sufficiently low and are topped up by very low benefits such that there is no way in which budgets can work. And 10 years ago, that didn't happen, but all sorts of factors have come into account, increased rents and decreased benefits being the main ones, which has meant that as we entered this pandemic, it's extraordinary that uh, Joseph Rantry Foundation published a, published a report saying 2.5 million fam people in the United Kingdom were experiencing destitution the sort of basest form of poverty that we thought we had eradicated, but had experienced destitution in the year before the pandemic. And that was up a third from two years previously. So we enter the pandemic with lots of people in a perilous state, just about making ends meet, some not even making ends meet. And then this pushes on them. And it's those are the people for whom a jubilee and a resetting of their debt could be transformative. Sorry, Hannah, I interrupted. I apologize. No, that's absolutely <laughs> wonderful. Thank you for sharing that um, extra bit as well. I was just wondering, we uh, have started talking about reset the debt and the issue that we're facing sort of last summer, summer 2020. Where do we find ourselves now? Uh, some time has passed. We've had the kind of continued extension to the lockdowns and the different provisions that are in place. Where, where do people in this situation find themselves at the moment? Well, what the data when we heard this from communities that debt was building up we went to look at, we looked around to find if whether there was any evidence any data out there to sort of support the observation and it became very clear that debts were building up i think by the end of that by the end of that summer citizens advice had published that six million people were behind on at least one bill so we knew that this was a problem and as time has gone on, we've got more and more data to say that, A, there's a huge amount of debt out there, about 10 billion in low income families has been raised as a, has been sort of added as a, as a result of lockdown. About 3 million more families are going to need debt advice as a result of the pandemic. And that's an extraordinarily large proportion of the British population are going to need debt advice because of this. And we also know that as the thing time has moved on, the debt has slowly built up. And as Bev pointed out, the government's response, which was to stop people being chased for their debt, to stop evictions, to stop bailiffs, is great, but it merely holds back the problem. It doesn't stop the problem. There is, will come a point when those measures go away and people will be evicted and people will be chased. Just yesterday, step change estimated about 125,000 are likely to face eviction within a year. And I, going through their numbers, that looks a bit low from data from other people. I, I would suggest it was likely to be a bit, wee bit higher than that. So that's the trajectory we're on. So the question is, how do we stop it? And Jubilee is one, one policy that will get in the way of that. So perhaps in a moment, Paul, you can just outline to us what the proposals of Reset the Debt are. But I wonder, we've got some measures in place already in the UK to deal with problem debt. You've got debt advice, you've got things like the new breathing space scheme that the government are bringing in and, and things like um, debt relief orders. Why aren't those things enough to deal with the situation that we're facing now and post pandemic? I think large amounts of this debt is going to be written off because it can't be repaid. And that is all that happens to debt that cannot be repaid. It eventually gets written off. The choice we have is how much pain we put people through and how long we allow the debt to rot away at people's lives. That, that's the only choice we have in this situation. And the current mechanisms are for normal times. And they weren't particularly good in the first place but there were processes by which debt got written off slowly. 
Now, they, now they are going to be overwhelmed by the number of people who need that support and by the number of people who need that help. So it's a capacity issue, but it's also an issue of what is the purpose of making someone go through a process that lasts, takes years away from their lives and holds them back. If at the end point, what is gonna happen is that debt is going to be written off. There is no purpose, there is only harm in doing that. So let's write it off first and allow families to try move forward with their lives. It also is that when it's written off, it's the lender who pays the price. And often the lender in this circumstance is probably lent really responsibly. So if you're a small landlord and you're renting out one or two houses, you probably can't afford your mortgage if the rent's not coming in. So by Jubilee, we're saying to the lenders as well, you can restart that this debt will be written off, not at your expense, but at all of our expense. And I suppose the underlying principle is Lockdown was to help all of us. It was a public health measure to help all of us. So the costs of it going forward should be borne by all of us. They shouldn't just fall on the poorest and those who are unfortunate enough to have lent to the poorest and, and will then have those debts written off at their cost. It should be shared. So just to outline for us, Paul, what is Reset that are asking for from the government in response? The, the first report was, was asked very clearly for a five billion pound pot of money to be put up that would repay debts and write them off. So essentially the debt was bought up by the government and then canceled. And that would go to, especially to be focused on council tax and on rent on the grounds. Those are the things that, those are the priority debts that really sort of threaten your well-being in a big way, plus other, other grants to be given out through universal credit to pay off other, other uh, debts that were taken on. I think as time's moved on, we've worked with Jubilee Debt Campaign and a, and a few others to have debts about it, have debts, have, have proposals around interfering in the secondary debt market, which is very complicated, but essentially debt that you owe is often sold and it's sold at a knockdown price. So the way in which the government could make the most out of its money is by buying debt in that market and canceling it there. Because often debt is sold off at around about nine pence for every pound. So paying nine pence could write off a pound's worth of debt for a low income family. So we've developed the ask because actually as time's gone on, the five billion pound fund begins to look slightly puny but it's important and the five billion pound fund would transform lives. And just one last thing on money is five billion pounds sounds like a lot. And if it was in any of our bank accounts, we'd probably be feeling quite happy right now. But in the terms of the COVID, in the terms of COVID, five billion pounds is an absolute drop in the ocean. We've paid around about 380 billion pounds to business to keep them afloat. And that, you know, I, that, I'm not criticizing that, but I am saying 380 billion pounds to keep businesses afloat. If they don't have customers and they don't have workers who are in a good place, that's money down the drain. For 5 billion pounds, you have customers and you have workers who are in a place to move forward after this after this pandemic. So not only is it compassionate, it makes economic sense too. Thank you, Paul. And I think that the kind of economic behind this are a really important part of the, the campaign and the proposals. But as churches as well, we're holding really tightly to the fact that the theology behind it is really important to us. So I'd, I'd love to bring in Mike now. Um, Mike, could you talk to us a little bit about Jubilee? Um, yeah, thanks. Well, I'll, I'll do my best. Um, I, I mean, Jubilee is in the Bible. Um, it's mentioned, um, it's only mentioned in the Old Testament uh, and in not many places, but a, but a fairly central part of what's called the Holiness Code in the book of Leviticus. So right near the end of Leviticus, chapter 25, virtually all of that chapter is devoted to what's called the Jubilee year, which has lots of different provisions. The basic idea about it really, in essence, is that every 50 years, um, there's a kind of stop put on 
uh, normal economic relations. And, and things are reset, to coin the phrase, uh, particularly that involves land. It also involves slaves as well, uh, or at least certain ah. slaves, but particularly about land. And of course, for, for that time, land is capital. I mean, people didn't have money in their bank accounts. What you owned principally, your main asset would be land. So it, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not just about land in a sense. It's also about, about what you control and about your power. But the idea was that land would go back to their original owners every 50 years. So whatever you had, whatever you possessed, in a sense, was always on loan to the original owners, um, which uh, technically would be the, the people who owned it 50 years ago or in the beginning. But behind that was the real idea that all land really belongs to God. Um, and that what we have is a gift. And therefore, we, there, is, there are certain kind of expectations about how we use those kind of things. So that the idea there was this 50 year kind of restart every, every 50 years as time went on. But I think behind it is a number of important kind of understandings about things, which are perhaps uh, more applicable to, to today's situation, which is, of course, a very different kind of um, uh, context. Um, but, it's, but, but human beings are the same and, and our systems have failings as, as, as all human systems do. So one, one, I think one main understanding about it is that, is that things get worse over time. You know, we make a mess of things. Some things improve, some things get worse. But actually, some things get, get, get become systemic and endemic. And, and so people end up in a, in a trap which they cannot get themselves out of. And the whole part of this is actually to allow people to then have their age, agency and their own destiny to be able to see their own future. And so 50 years is not accidental, but it's a kind of once in a generation or a bit more kind of time. So that everybody in their lifetime would experience a, a jubilee, this idea that actually systems go bad over time and therefore there needs to be some kind of divine intervention uh, which, which, which helps uh, humankind. And underneath that is the whole idea that, that, that God is behind it, God's sovereignty. That the Israelites who've been released by God from slavery should then not enslave other people, well, and certainly should not enslave each other. That society is about people belonging to each other um, in, in harmony, really. Um, I, could, I could go on about all the exceptions. People can ask me questions if you want to, really. But, um, but, uh, but it's, it's, it's about going back Going back to the heart of things really is, is, I think, what Jubilee is in essence about. Thank you, Mike. And you've, you've started to touch on it a bit there, but we've got this kind of economic principle with kind of quite deep moral um, foundations behind it. What do you think those, those kind of moral foundations behind Jubilee have to say to us at this moment as we kind of look forward from the pandemic of, around recovery and the, the issues that we've been talking about? I mean, I think one is one is to, to recognise that this, in this, in a sense, this isn't. Although it's about it's about debt and money, it's actually about what lies behind those things. And the the, impo the important thing about Jubilee is it's not some tech. It it looks like a technical piece of legislation, but actually behind it is a powerful understanding about how people should relate to each other, about how society should work, about the constraints on on power and and its abuse. And I think it's also there about about how people should enjoy being together as a society. There's aspects of it which are which are spiritual. So occasionally that the Pope will announce a papal year of jubilee, which is about spiritual renewal. And and in a sense, spiritual renewal and and socio-economic renewal are all interlinked there. Um, so that there are there are worshipping uh, aspects to it. Originally, the jubilee would be announced by the the sound of a, a ram's horn being blown, the shofar. Um, that that would, which is a, a kind of wonderful kind of image, really, uh, to to herald a, a new a new beginning for people, really, um, and perhaps also recognition that, and this perhaps touches on what both Bev and Paul have been saying, life is intrinsically unfair, and 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 the variety of reasons for that, and and whilst some debt, we have personal responsibility, of course. Sometimes we get into a mess for things that we are we cannot be that cannot be deemed to be our responsibility. Accidents happen, there are catastrophes, and that happened in ancient times, just as it happens today, and, and the pandemic would be an example of a catastrophe that has just hit people, and of course it's hit some people very disproportionately. Um, and therefore in such situations we recognise that actually you know, Jubilee is, 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 is a kind of levelling up agenda, really. It's, it's not trying to say we're trying to, trying to be fair to everybody, we're trying to say what is the best, the best fairness that we can actually have um, in our society. Mike and and there's a reason that the churches are running this campaign that there's a, a Christian push behind what we're asking for here yeah. 
how do we have that distinctively Christian voice as we speak about debt at the moment? What are the, the things and the, the messages that we can get through that, that share that heart for how God loves people and how we love people as we talk about this issue? I think, I think one important aspect is the whole idea of grace. Um, and, it, and it's there, this is of course in the New Testament as, as, as one of the Hebrew scriptures, the idea that, that, that God redeems people irrespective you know, it's it's unconditional. It doesn't depend on the amount of contributions that you can bring to the table, um, because in the end, you, you you can't dig yourself out of the hole. So it requires divine agency. So this this idea of God's grace, um, which is indiscriminate, um, and and equally therefore, the the idea of jubilee has a certain indiscriminate nature about it, and so too with the with the campaign to reset the debt, um, and of course Jesus talked about forgiving other people and the kingdom of God being there amongst us, but particularly for those who are most marginalized and most excluded in our society. One of the things I would say is that I think as a, a part of our Christian voice is, is actually about helping other people's voices to be heard as well. And particularly the voices of those who often are not heard, but some of the kind of accounts that Bev was relating earlier on are the other stories that people need to hear more about to actually understand why this is so important and indeed why it isn't not just their benefits but actually i would argue i think as paul does it actually benefits the whole of our society actually in the long run having a society in which lots of people are trapped in debt is is no good for anybody actually it, it stifles our economy let alone the actual human experience of people and all the suffering that they go through through that time um, but i think most of all it's it's the idea that actually um, there are limits to exploitation um, and that ultimately everything we have in a sense, is is given to us uh, leasehold, as it were, by God, um, not freehold. And therefore, underneath what we have and our relations is this idea of God's sovereignty. Thank you, Mike. I think there's a lot to chew over there as we go forward, and maybe we'll have some questions on it afterwards as well. I think we'd just like to take it back to, to some of our local church context and, and think really about how that plays out for us day to day as we're churches serving our communities. And I'd, I'd like to bring Cassius in now. Um, Cassius, uh, your work particularly thinks about kind of local people and how you're equipping them at the moment to deal with some of the challenges that the pandemic has thrown up. Could you talk to us a little bit about the work you've been doing through the COVID cash recovery course? Sure. So the the work that I do is uh, primarily in the Black Country. Uh, so in the area that Bev described earlier, Warsaw, Wolverhampton, San Sandwell and Dudley, and then the wider diocese of Litchfield. Uh, when the first lockdown happened, uh, a, a colleague of mine actually, uh, Alison Sang, uh, with uh, Compassionate Communities in, in London and myself got together and said we needed to put some kind of materials together for people who were coming and asking questions about where they could access help uh, what kind of support was available in local communities and um, basic information around budgeting and, and that kind of that kind of thing but also uh, concerns around mental health even at that early stage for people who were offering support and were all of a sudden um, being pulled in lots of different directions uh, supporting families neighbors and 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 also wanting support to offer support through their churches. So the, the course that we developed uh, was uh, transformed into what's now called the COVID cash recovery course. Uh, that's a, a two and a half hour train in the trainers course that, that has been delivered nationally uh, alongside our colleagues, uh, the Just Finance team in London and across uh, England to over 1400 people, uh, people in churches, uh, people in organizations uh, working voluntarily and people of, of all faiths and none. And so it's been, it's been a real pleasure to be able to, to just deliver those sessions to a whole range of people, uh, just as one response uh, to the, the pandemic and, and recognizing that actually ordinary people are able to contribute uh, small things, even if they're, they're not qualified 
debt advisors because this is not training people to be debt advisors or financial advisors as needed as those people are. Uh, we just try and arm people with some basic uh, key bits of information that they can help others with. And so whilst you've been doing this work, Cassius, Transforming Communities Together has also been a really key partner for Reset the Debt. And you, you came alongside really early on for that um, campaigning element of what we're asking for around policy change. Why do you think it's important that the church is doing this work on a practical level through the things that you've just described and on that kind of campaigning level that's looking at what policy change is needed to address the issues? Yeah, a couple of couple of reasons that are really important to me. Firstly, one of the, the scriptures that we use through our work with transforming communities uh, together on a on a regular basis is that those verses in Matthew chapter 25 um, you know when when Jesus says whatever you did for the least of these you did you did for me and and so there is that imperative for me as a follower of Jesus in in those words recognizing that I think we all have a responsibility as Christians um, to engage with those who are um, uh, who are the the I don't want to say the least, but those who 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 need most help uh, within our our communities. I think there's there's also a sense for me that I've seen a huge amount of community activity from the first lockdown, um, that actually wasn't about Christians or or people of faith, but neighbours who wanted to engage and just help in their local communities and, and one of my hopes coming out of this uh, pandemic is that that continues beyond the lockdown that community spirit uh, but within that for me i felt and still feel that it's really important for us as christians uh, to be seen in the ways that we are able to contribute so i think uh, very often there's a huge amount that is done that happens behind the scenes and you know, very often we're not the people to shout and to sing about everything that we, we do, which is which is great. Um, but I do think there are times when we need to uh, we need to articulate the things that that we are doing and the ways that we are contributing to our communities and, and wider society. And I think that the, the last thing that I would say is is related to um, something that Mike said, actually, I, I really feel quite strongly that this is an issue that we have to recognize poverty is just not for others it's not for another section of society it, it this is something that impacts all of us uh, so to me that debt burden that weighs on people costs all of us at some point you know through services that people will need to access through you know the help that that others will need within their communities. Uh, but also in addition to that, um, I recognize that the, the, the potential that is lost, you know, thinking about that, that huge number, the third of children that Bev described living in poverty. And, and yes, there are, there are always success stories, people who will um, escape poverty and, and we'll be able to move on and do well. But for the vast majority, um, my feeling is that actually they can be trapped into poverty. And they, these could be the, the people who are, are looking after me in my old age, you know, if I, if I get to live as old as, as Captain Tom, um, they're gonna be the decision makers. Uh, I, I don't want to uh, be a part of limiting that potential. And I think this reset the debt, this jubilee gives us an opportunity to help uh, so many people realise potential that otherwise may be, may be lost. Thank you, Cassius. I think that's a really powerful calling for us to respond to that. And I wonder just as a final question, what do you, what do you think it says about our mission as the church that we are both acting in compassion and service to people locally and speaking up? to call for moments of jubilee, for moments of transformation? Yeah, I, I think it, 
you know, in really basic terms, I, I hope that it demonstrates that we care as Christians in our communities that, you know, that as followers of Jesus, you know, we pray, uh, but we are people of action. Um, so, you know, at, at that really basic level, I, I hope that that is communicated uh, through, through what we do. But I also think particularly with this kind of campaign that it, it demonstrates that we, you know, as great as the food banks are that we have seen spring up and there are huge questions for me. Uh, about the, that amazing work that takes uh, place across our country. So, so please don't mishear me, it's, it's fantastic. But I think there are questions for us that, you know, what are we the fifth richest economy in the world? Um, having people rely on, on food banks, I, I think, you know, that, that is something that weighs heavily on, on my mind. And so there is something for me that is also saying alongside all of the great works that that churches and others are doing through food banks and other activities that we are also concerned about addressing the systems that hold people in debt and in poverty and so it is not just about the the physical activity of it if you like but it but it is also about um, doing some of that challenging authorities or informing our, our leaders and decision makers uh, and, and, and doing that actively as, as followers of Jesus and saying that this is part of our faith. Thank you Cassius, I think that's a really helpful link to make as we look back on um, the conversation that we've just had. Um, before we open up to a time of, of questions and discussion, I'd like to share with you guys some other ways that you can get involved with reset the debt and our campaign going forward. Um, I just uh, share my screen with you to show you about an event that we are holding next Friday. Um, so reset the debt has been going on um, since last October uh, and this Friday we are holding a day of prayer and action. So we're going to be coming together um, to pray about the things that we've been discussing today but also as Cassius has just highlighted to, to, uh, to be people of action um, around this as well, recognising that it's the, the bringing together of those two things that, that brings our distinctively Christian voice uh, into this moment. So we're coming together next Friday for that. On the day, um, we'll have various different things going on. Um, you could join us uh, around 12.45 for a live prayer broadcast that will bring together church leaders and MPs um, to to stand alongside people who are weighed down by debt at the moment, to pray for just and compassionate solutions um, to the crisis that, as we've highlighted today, is part of all of our responsibility um, to face. And we'll also have moments of prayer, um, contemplative prayer uh, and active prayer throughout the day that will be um, shared on our website, resetthedebt.uk, uh, and also through um, JPIT's social media channels that you can find um, if you head onto that web address. And we'll also have throughout the day um, some of our, our kind of starter actions for the campaign that can enable you to, to take action to speak up. We've got a petition launched at the moment that you can find on the website that is, a, if you've got one minute, a really easy action, um, but a powerful one to add your voice to the call for this movement. But then we're also really encouraging people to start a conversation with their MP. Um, one of the most powerful things that we've had through this campaign is hundreds of constituents contacting their MPs and raising this issue with them. And it's really enabled us to build a map of, of how Parliament is responding to this issue at the moment and map ways forward um, that can offer us ways in to make really meaningful change. And so on our website, we have a template letter that you can use that you can personalise if you're doing work locally with stories or experiences that you've had to share with your MP why this is an important issue for you and then start that ongoing conversation. And we've also got um, opportunities for you to bring other people into this. You might be a member of a church community where you can go back and, and talk to people around you about what you've heard today and some of the issues behind this. And on our website, we have um, stories a bit like the one we shared at the beginning of people who have been experiencing debt, particularly because of COVID-19. 
And we've also got things like a group exploration session for small groups. That's a chance to dig into some of the theology behind this, to chat about the issue and where you've seen it in your community and to think about how you guys might respond. So I'd really invite you to, um, to head onto our website. So that's resetthedebt.uk um, to explore some of those things and to find out how you can play a part in this kind of bigger movement that we're building around this. Um, we love that it's ecumenical. We love that it's um, bringing people together from different experiences of life and holding people with lived experience at the center particularly. Um, so we'd really um, value your engagement as we go forward. So we've got a, a chance now for questions and I'll hand back to Catherine, who I think is going to lead us through that. Well, well thank you ever so much, um, Hannah and our wonderful set of panellists. Um, your, your words have been really powerful um, and uh, have given us a huge amount to pray for, uh, to act upon, to, to, reflect, to reflect upon a really um, moving uh, um, narrative planned narrative so thank you Hannah very much indeed and now it's it's time to turn to our, our participants to hear your feedback to hear your your thoughts um, and reflections on what you've heard um, thank you for those who've already posted in the chat I wonder if we could go to Marion uh, Kenyon first of all who's made a couple of really helpful uh, comments about her own context perhaps you could you could tell us what you're up to Marion <coughs> to start us off yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, I work for a Christian charity um, that's based in North Worcestershire and South West Birmingham. Um, strange grouping of, of areas. Um, before the pandemic started, we used to do about 10 food parcels. We're a f furniture reuse project. That's what we mostly do. We provide furniture free of charge to people moving into new properties. We've always had a food bank, but we used to do about 10 food parcels a week. The pandemic hit and we suddenly went to 70, then 100, um, and obviously we were providing the food. We also realised very quickly that with the best will in the world, giving people three days worth of food was not really very helpful if they had no food. And also that expecting people to live on tins of food was also not particularly helpful. So over the period of the last year, um, we changed completely. So we provide fresh meat, fresh, we provide cheese, bread, butter, things that you normally find and vegetables and fruit in our food parcels for seven days um, and we've provided in excess of 220,000 meals through that process. We've also worked with other groups to help during holidays in particular we've given out packed lunches, we've paid for packed lunches um, and we are just about to start working with community money advice um, to start providing some debt advice that's taken a bit longer than we thought it would to set up it's amazing how difficult it is to contact people in a pandemic um, and get them onto training courses and all sorts of things. So we've, we've started that. But before the pandemic, we'd already started to look into the purchase of debt. Um, because as you say, you can buy it really cheaply. You can buy debt really, really cheaply. Um, and we had this idea that we could buy it and then we could write off the debt or what we needed was starter funds to do that we found somebody that was willing to help us out with that um, but also that we would encourage people that we were paying the debt off for to pay their proportion so but it, so instead of them having to pay two and a half thousand ten thousand they would be paying maybe a couple of hundred pounds off that might take them a year and then they were free because I think, as Paul mentioned, you know, making people jump through hoops, with the, even with the best intentions, they're going to lose their children's childhoods. They're going to, they're going to be childhoods beset with worry. Um, and so we, we thought that this was an idea. We are progressing it, and we've written to the Charity Commission, who felt that our objects did not cover it. So we need to change our objects, apparently. That's all we need to do, is change the objects, which is great. We thought it might be more complicated than that, but we're, we're hoping to do that and to then progress that. And I sort of think, actually, if lots of churches wanted to do that, we could all get together and have a great big fund, and then we could just do it, and then we wouldn't need the government to worry about it too much. You know, We could just go ahead and do it. It has been done in Walthamstow in East London. Um, there was something called... Um, and I always get this wrong. 
it's not HSBC, it's, it's something like, Host, it's Host Street, uh, HSCB, Host Street Central Bank. And they blew up the, the, the letters. They blew up the debts in a van, which was very dramatic. Um, but so, so that's where we are. And I guess it's just, I, I think this is just such a good opportunity for the church. I think, you know, it's, it's a terrible thing that's happened. And what we've seen as well is lots of people who are wealthier, who you would put in that wealthy group. We have some very wealthy areas in, in Bromsgrove in particular. However, we've been delivering food parcels into those wealthy areas because if you lose 20% of your income because you're furloughed, to be quite honest, if you're living at the max of your income already, it doesn't really matter how much you're earning. You can, you can be considered wealthy. And in the past, we've done debt advice and we had a surgeon, uh, a local surgeon from one of the big hospitals who was one of our clients because he couldn't manage his debt. And I think that's the thing. I think we have this idea in our heads that it's a, it's mostly a certain group of people, but actually it's hugely important that we remember that there are lots of people at the upper end of incomes who also struggle with debt. Thank you, Marion. That's fun. Okay. That's really fantastic. So how, um, just on this idea of um, paying off, uh, uh, paying off people's debt, I wonder yeah. if the, the panel have any response to that. I mean, you presumably you knew who you were paying off the debt for um, in your communities. It sounded like, like that. That's um, what we would do. Yeah, we would. Yeah, you, you knew the people. Postcode. You can buy it by, by postcode en masse from a bank. Okay, let's have a feedback on the from the panel on that. If, 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 if anybody moved to speak, then 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 do do say thank you ever so much, Marion. That was stimulating. Uh, yeah, I, I suppose I, I should because. Bizarrely, the uh, bizarrely the, the ask around secondary debt markets comes from from South Korea, and I, I had a, an enormous fun for a week reading Google Translate documents from South Korea to try work out what what it meant. I think there are two things that, when debt is put into a debt management plan, it is often then packaged off into one tranche so you can find it. But before it's put into a debt management plan, it's often very hard to find it. So it may be sold in different places, but finding it to buy it in that way is quite difficult. So on a, for a small group and for a small scale operation, it becomes very difficult to find the correct debt, get the sufficient licenses to trade on the secondary debt market because you're not allowed to just go and do that. You need to go through a broker. Uh, and that, that also costs money. And I think, so, it is possible to do, and I think as a demonstration of commitment, it's, it's very, very powerful. I think I would say we do need government though. One, because they're the only ones with that much funds, but two, because government is our, government is about our communal response, our joint and collective response to a situation. And actually, there, our joint and collective response should be not to let debt lay upon these people. And it's great that people are intervening in small in, in ways in their own communities, but actually we need a much broader response across lots of communities and that requires the government to do it. Thank you, Paul. That's a really helpful, um, you know, turning back to government the, the, you know the importance of government taking a role um, in in this field. Um, did the other panelists want to say, Mike? Is that your hand? Yes, over to you. A, a, a brief comment, really. I mean, uh, I, I'm not an economist, uh, but I think uh, first of all to say to Marion, I think it's a brilliantly provocative idea. I think I think the value may be more in in, in actually provoking those questions amongst a wider wider audience. And therefore, I, I agree with Paul. In the end, this should be the government. But I think. You know, this this is this is genius in, in many ways um notwithstanding the practical difficulties that that you know and, and legal stuff that marion's up against i mean my my, my economist here may, may disagree I'm, i guess my worry my one worry would be that i mean one of the reasons that you buy up debt so cheaply it is because the risk of non-payment is so high and and, and the costs of and the costs of the organization or the person in trying to get that debt or, or some of it back I guess if it was really successful, what Marion's doing, actually she would find that, that the price goes up and it becomes harder to do. 
but I, but I, but 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 all of us. I mean, those who are involved in debt management know, you know, how willing uh, companies are to 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 accept a, you know repayment plans and very different kind of terms. They're just grateful to get anything back sometimes of the debt, and, and you realise how the power, which at first seems to be all with the lender, actually can shift quite quickly. And I think what Marion is doing is is part of that whole process, and and so uh, I applaud it. Brilliant. I wonder if we could, um, whether Tracy might be um, willing to say any words to make some reflections. Thank you for your comments in the chat, Tracy. If you'd like to unmute yourself, if you wish to speak, you'd be welcome to do so. Oh, brilliant. Thank you. I'm sorry, I'm a bit of a speaker. I've been in debt management plans, um, IVAs, I've been bankrupt twice, and it's through no real fault of my own. It's just through the situations of divorce really that's put me in that situation um but now i'm just about surviving i've been on i've been taken from a full-time job to a part-time job which is a christian organization and believe me i love it but my wages have literally dropped by about 500 pounds a month because of going through that however what i will say is god has covered my bills you know, the amazing thing is we've got an amazing God and he's helped support me through that time. I don't really foresee me going back into working full time. So he's going to carry on covering them, I think. But the one thing I found is everybody is working and helping together to support people around this particular area. It's quite a poor area of Wolverhampton I live in. I used to do a soup kitchen over the summer holidays because I worked in schools the soup kitchen did about 70 people maximum to 100 um, when they've sort of like closed because they can't sit these people down they've now gone round and they're going around supporting people by giving them food on a thursday but they've gone from doing 70 people maximum to 400 people i've given out food parcels um, the food parcel resource where i was going to which was through one of the churches I started off with about, say, three or four. I ended up with 15, 20 people maximum. Um, they only give them out every two, two weeks. Um, so it would be two weeks of food. The food itself they were giving were mainly what I say was British food that we'd, you know, the Brits would eat. Um, and I've got a lot of ethnic minorities around by where I live. So I was discovering that some of them would accept the food, but they pile it, they stop pile it outside of the tins that they didn't want, like the baked beans, the pasta, um, the bolognese sauces, they just didn't eat it, but they were grateful for what they were given. Once I'd realized this, then I had to go into them and say, right, I see what you're doing. We could send that food elsewhere, but what are you really looking for? And so I had to find another source of where they were getting fresh food, which is what they ate. So now the food parcels have now deteriorated because the well, which is where all our fresh food comes from, everything, all the support has now gone into them. Yeah. So then now what I do with the families, I don't go and deliver to them anymore, but I turn around and I, I say, right, you're in need of a food parcel. And I just contact the well and pass that information on. But even they're just so overwhelmed with the amount of people. When the kids have been off school, the parents a lot of times have had to supply food for their kids and they just couldn't do it. So the food parcels increased for that reason. And I'm talking about, the, they were supplying food parcels for children who had free school meals, but some of these kids didn't get free school meals for whatever reason, the parents have got just above that amount. And they were coming to us and say, we can't get the free school meals, but we can't feed our kids. And you're talking months. Um, so, so basically I'm discovering that people going down to soup kitchens, cause I'm attached to a soup kitchen, the Good Shepherd in Wolverhampton, one of my, my tenants is actually work, not working down there, but supports down there. So I go in and see him and they're saying to me that people who are even working can manage to feed themselves, say, five days a week, but they go to the soup kitchen for the other two. 
and we are in one of the most economical wealthy countries in the world and we have that do you think reset the debt would make a big difference do you think yeah tracy absolutely yeah. thank you for there are people that you could say has got themselves in it but i'm i'm working with a family who i i would say are in debt we've supplied them with loads of um they've said right we need a wardrobe we need a chest of drawers we need this that and the other we've supplied them but they tend to disappear um and they're always coming have you got so and so have you got so and so but you supply them with the goods and they tend to dis disappear and i know what they're doing they're selling because there's a debt there um and we're sort of like trying to say can we help you be honest is there more to this than meeting the eye and it's just trying to get through to them to open up a lot more Tracy, thank you ever so much for your sharing. Just you, you know, you're you're fleshing out these you know familiar stories on the ground. It's really powerful to hear your stories. Thank you. Yeah. I wondered if if Bev uh, would like to respond or any of the panelists in particular, um, any comments. I didn't come to you before, so I just wanted to give you a chance to speak again. Yeah, I was I was just going to say one of the things we found with the food bank in the past as well that often usage drops off in the summer holidays. And the reason for that is parents have their children with them and they don't want their children to see that they're having to access the food bank. So if you sort of put that through this whole time of pandemic when they've had children at home with them. And I think as somebody has put in the comments as well, the costs have increased. Um, when we were short of supply, we've been really lucky. We've had amazing response from the community of people giving to the food bank. Um, uh, but when we've been short and I've gone to the supermarket to try and buy things, all those cheaper saver items, not that I'm saying somebody in the food bank only deserves the sort of saver price, but actually you can get more for your money. And actually what you could get, um, you know, your £50 spend, you're probably getting half the, half the number of items that you would do previously. So people's costs have gone up, um, they're, they're having to heat their homes more. And it's a, it's a real choice for people. Do I heat my home? Do I feed my kids? What do I do? And then I think suddenly they're going back to school as well. The number of people that we heard when they got text messages saying, please check your child's uniform still fits. And suddenly the thought of having to buy new school shoes. Um, for some people, it was just too much. They just couldn't do it. And I think I'd like to comment on something that um, Cassia said um, about the divide. And I think it's something that I alluded to. I'm also a trustee of a multi-academy trust. And one of the key things and one of our themes is social mobility. And um, we have just seen that has just gone backwards over the last 12 months through no fault of the schools at all. It's just the situation we're in. And it's just it's just all this progress that was being made has just gone. And um, it's just going to become even more critical. Um, and it's really, we need to do something. We really do. Um, poignant words there. Alison, would you like to make a comment? Alison Wilson? To make your uh, your comment. Um, well, it wasn't it wasn't really a question. It was just a, a comment to say that although this is a UK government thing, those of us who are north of the border have a, an election coming up for Holyrood, the sixth of May, and certainly the candidates who are representing. UK wide or at least GB wide parties could be asked at the doorstep or wherever else and it could be enlightening what response you get from individuals um, and I don't see any point in saying oh well um, the, that's nothing to do with us. I would ask councillors, MSPs, anybody and everybody and if, if you don't really get anywhere at least you've raised their awareness remembering scotland in there thank you that's so that's really important alison are we in these letters to our mps are we um aiming for any particular date for action to be uh, you know are, are things happening in parliament that we should be aware of where this is discussed or is it just ongoing hannah yeah, so I think in response to Alison's point, I think that's really helpful us and we're actually um, working with the Poverty Alliance in Scotland um, and hopefully building on some of those ideas with them. So really great that you've raised it because it encourages us to go away and, 
and and put some of the the work in there to help people do that um so thank you and um in terms of writing to mps and the parliamentary action one of the one of the kind of primary issues for us, for us at the moment is that the issue hasn't necessarily been platformed in parliament in the way it should there hasn't been that kind of widespread recognition that household debt is an issue for people and the need for a response so one of the things we're working on with parliamentarians at the moment is raising that issue with front bench mps so when you write to your mp through our system you'll see that the action is to ask them to write their write to their treasury team and um, depending on the party that they're in to ask how they would respond to the issue and what they think of the proposals and we're also hopefully looking in the in the coming months at um actions like a, a backbench debate and other kind of parliamentary actions um to raise that uh, on in parliament to to get this response so do um head over to the website and write to your mp but also keep in touch with us because we'll have extra actions to keep that conversation going on as things develop brilliant cassius that's really helpful hannah thank you cassius over to you yeah i think that's a really helpful point uh by tracy thinking about the upcoming election. Um, I'm, I'm fairly new to this kind of campaigning, but one of my reflections is that we do have to be prepared to be in this for the long haul as well. Um, I, I see this very much as uh, as desperate as the situation is. We've, we've heard it described as a kind of tsunami. Uh, and, and for me at this stage, actually, the, the wave has, has gone out. I don't think we've seen the worst of, of the situation yet. I think, as others have already said, I think that will be coming. Um, but what we need to be preparing for is, is that moment when um, there, there is an opportunity really to, uh, to talk with uh, perhaps more authority to, to our leaders, decision makers, uh, so there will be opportunities as there is in, in Scotland with elections and um, the work that Hannah described is, is really important going forward and I'd encourage people to be engaged in that. But yeah, just, just to encourage people to be uh, engaged or to be prepared to be engaged for the long haul um, because I, I think there will be a moment uh, in the future when we do need to be uh, prepared uh, really to engage people in, in this campaign um, and, and really uh, challenge, challenge our government to, to be able to make a decision on this. But, but that moment for me hasn't, hasn't necessarily come yet. It's so valuable this session. I've learned so much myself and, and, you know, that harrowing language of a tsunami, the wave has gone out. I mean, we will take these images away with us and we will share them with our local churches. Um, so, um, Thank you. I, I, I think this time I'd like to go to um, Sandra and then Tamara. To, Sandra, would you like, Sandra works for a Citizens Advice Bureau in Truro. Um, Sandra, would you like to say anything? Or I know you've seen a lot on the ground of this, this, uh, this need. Um, I, I think most of it has been covered. I was nodding my head quite a bit. One little thing, well, it isn't little, but um, Bev, I think, mentioned about shoes. And I heard something on Radio 4 about quite a few children having um, trench foot because their shoes are ill-fitting. They've got plastic bags or whatever um, around them to stop their feet getting wet. But actually, um, it's from the wall, the name trench foot. Um, yeah, and yeah, there are all sorts of um, awful stories um, going on, but it's just, like everybody was saying, it's unmanageable debt. It's, it's debt, it's brilliant about buying it as well, but um, it's, um, yeah, and people just giving up hope, and I'm concerned that the suicide rate will go up higher as well, because people just have nowhere to turn and no hope. Hope. Yeah, that's ultimately what um, what's on our minds and 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 what what we can share. Um, thank you, Sandra. Tamara, would you like to make your your comment? Yes, I would like to ask the question whether it would be useful to expand this idea of the jubilee somewhat more and think about how uh, our current economic system 
actually contributes to uh, the situation we're in because uh, the economy will only uh, sort of reward those who are productive. Uh, it, it rewards those who are actually have something to offer already in terms of money, in terms of work, but what about those who have nothing to offer or not the same kind to offer, but something different? The, the, the economy as it stands will uh, basically uh, either completely forget those or uh, just not include them. It, it, the, as it stands, economy, economy is not inclusive. So my uh, question is, and I've heard it so many times lately, and uh, I'm stating the same as often as I can on Facebook, I do not want to go back to what it was before. So is there a, is there a point or is there, is there a possibility to include that in the campaign or in the in the in the general umbrella that uh, economy as such uh, cannot stay what it is. Thank you, Tamara. Really, really valuable point. Uh, let's go to the panelists, beginning with Hannah. Yeah, and um, thank nice you so you. much. Thank you so much for raising that, Tamara. I think you're absolutely um, right. And actually, um, so the group that, that I work for, the Joint Public Issues Team, we've we've been doing some work on the wider economy for a little while. And one thing that we talk about is how do we um, have an economy that enables the flourishing of all life? So what kind of different economic models um, do we need to look at that that moves away from what you've got one? Yeah, about... Yeah, the Bible is, is basically already an economic model. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. So what can we draw from our theology and from our kind of um, lived experience that we've been talking about today that models that differently? So I can pop a link in the chat um, that the Joint Public Issues team, we're, we're doing a little bit of work around that, um, you know, would love engagement around it too, um, to think about what kind of different economic models are out there. Mm. I'm ever so sorry. I've been missing Ian's hand. I haven't been looking at people's hands. So you've been very patient there, Ian. Uh, <laughs> um, over to you. What's your question? Hello there. Uh, let me just uh, stop my hand. No hand. There we go. Um, right. Hi, Hello there. Um, first of all, Hi. Cassia, thank you very much for putting this on LinkedIn. And it's great to connect with you again, my friend. Um, I, I don't know if anybody else here is from a credit union. Doesn't look like there is. Uh, but I imagine there are credit unions in your areas. And I just wonder how many people are already working with their credit union. Um, I, I like to describe um, the, the credit union as if you imagine a cliff edge of the financial cliff where people fall off that financial cliff. There are ambulances at the bottom of that financial cliff taking away people to financial hospital. And they are great organisations such as Debt Advice. Christians Against Poverty, CAB. There, there's many, many different ambulances that help people in many different ways. Credit unions are there to build a, a, a fence at the top of the cliff. And we do that by getting people into a savings habit. If you take Bradford, for mm -hmm. example, in the last mm -hmm. five years, we've grown from 3,000 members to 5,000 members. Uh, and we look after a staggering £6 million pounds in savings in an area of deprivation and we, we're very proud of that fact and we're also able to offer low-cost loans that, um, that stop people going to loan sharks and high-cost lenders. Everyone will have a credit union in their area, I encourage you to seek them out, but uh, credit unions serve as an anchor for a lot of the things that you're talking about credit unions are able to turn that into a reality for people because they can actually start to save and get low cost loans and start to deal with their debt. We're a preventative organization. We're not people that actually help people when they've got to that stage. That's over to many of you guys there. But if you use us as a preventative, we can stop a lot of people falling off that financial cliff. Valuable advice, and they're in every area of the country. Do you say, yeah. um, Ian? Three hundred and six credit unions across the UK. We all work in geographical areas. Amazing. Thank you for pointing that out. So, do our panelists want to to respond in any way to that? Uh, Paul. 
Yeah, I think we, uh, the church has been really supportive of credit unions for a long time. And the Methodist Church actually has one for its, uh, for the people who fall, there's a, you have to fall within a grouping to be part of a, a credit union and the method. And if you are linked to the Methodist Church, you can join one. And I think it's, uh, it's joint with the Anglicans, actually, I seem to remember. So, uh, yes, very much so. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I actually wanted to respond to what Tamara was saying uh, about economy, because I think it's that's extraordinarily important as we move out. I think credit unions are part of it on the grounds mm -hmm. that they are owned by the people who save within them. They are not there to make profit for anyone else. And that's re that's a really important concept that we need to, to hold to, that people that things are worthwhile even if they don't make a profit. And one of the things I'm, tomorrow, I'm really looking forward to a meeting with uh, Poverty Truth Commissions, who, have, who, are, who are linked, who are people who experience poverty and who are telling their own story and we're trying to work out, trying to convert that story into, 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 real, into policy. But one of the things we're going to be talking about is about an economy of contribution rather than one of profit. So this idea that if you're not productive, if, you're, if your labor doesn't give you enough money to live on, well, then you should probably go to a food bank. That's not on. Actually, most people desperately want to contribute to the society they're in. Most people desperately want to be part of this, to offer something. And, some people, and for some people that will earn them a fortune. And for some people, it might endure them anything, but all should be valued. And one of the, and so moving forward is how we can have this idea of contribution as part of our economy. And, uh, and I think again, within Reset the Debt, again, it is about people who wish to contribute. Are they gonna be in a place where they can contribute to society at the end of, as we come out of lockdown? And what we want is to put them in a place where they can contribute because they will and they want to. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Paul. That's, that's really helpful. I, I wonder if I've missed anybody. Ahmed, would you like to say anything about, you've made some comments about the economic system. I don't know if that builds on what we've just been hearing. We, we are drawing near to our close, but I um, just wanted to give you a chance to speak if, if, if you had wanted to. Uh, yes, thank you very much. I'm sorry, I joined uh, a bit late. I was. Um, uh, in, involved in another training course earlier. Uh, and, uh, yes, I, I would really, uh, I was really encouraged when I came across um, a Christian lady in uh, my neck of the woods in Mosley in Birmingham, who was um, distributing leaflets about how uh, usury is, um, is, is forbidden and how usury is, um, which the fancy name is interest. Um, which is again very interesting how uh, the term has been hijacked um, so to make it attractive. Um, so how that is um, actually exploitation of people who need uh, the help uh, most. So I, I believe in, uh, I am a Muslim and uh, it's in Islamic tradition, Islamic theology also very, much against uh, this uh, usury and um, interest, which is known as interest now. And uh, I don't know what um, the sociological position uh, of Christianity is on that. According to that lady, it is uh, forbidden, but I, I don't know about that personally. And th we have models uh, in Pakistan, for example, this Akhwat Foundation has been very successful and they're recovery rate from these people who they'll give money to as a sign an interest-free loan is above 99 percent which which is really amazing um, where they don't uh, take any collateral or anything like that despite that so I don't know well, that's right, just... no that's great thank you thank you um of course this is a Christian campaign but over to Mike in, in a moment uh, but um you know, is there is there work to make this an interfaith thing? Reset the debt. Over to you, Mike. Um, that, that, that's a really interesting uh, question. I'm sure there's 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 common ground. I mean, certainly on the campaign for international debt, 
in the Jubilee 2000 there was. I mean, just to pick up particularly Ahmed's point, I mean, certainly he's, he's absolutely right. There's a very there's a very interesting tradition within Islamic finance of regulations about usury. Christian ones are slightly different, but there is but there is a prohibition on usury. We, we're just not been able to define it quite so tightly and people spent an awful lot of time in the Middle Ages trying to work these things out and it's precisely what it was. What I'd like to, I suppose it's going back, a bit back to what Tamara said, and I'll try and be really brief. I think I think what uh, what what's behind it really and and the way forward is is an understanding of of power within economic transactions. I don't think the Bible gives us an economic blueprint going forward. It does, however, gives us a set of important questions and, and priorities about 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 how our who our economies are affecting and why, um, so that we can actually try and in every different age they might be reframed differently. But those kind of questions, so that, for instance, on the issue of risk, you know. In debt negotiations, it's the it's the it's the people with least power, the most marginalised, who actually are most exposed and most vulnerable in such negotiations. With when in Islamic finance and other models which are around there too, and within certain Christian traditions, the risk is more shared. And I think the idea in which we are more in this together, as Paul was saying, which is less about profit but more about shared interest, I think is is a, is is a, is one helpful contribution. So helpful, Mike. Thank you ever so much. That's um, that's really helpful. I'm going to turn uh, finally, I think, to unless anyone's burning for an extra question, uh, to Rachel, who's patiently waited to ask her, I think, also economic question. Um, over to you, Rachel. Um, it was just a, a quick, a quick comment, actually, folks. I know we were talking about um, alternative models to um, capitalism. What if people want to contribute? I don't know if people are aware of something called a time bank. Um, I've worked as a time bank broker in the past, and it's a way of people contributing skills. Um, and so everyone's time is worth the same. So if you contribute, if a, if a, you know, a, an electrician contributes an hour, and somebody who can mend trousers contributes an hour. It's all counted as the same, and it's just a it's just a system that that involves no money. That's a way of contributing um, and sharing time and skills. And I just think it's an encouraging model, looking at kind of social capital rather than finance, just as a as an idea. That I thought I would throw out there. So time banking, and there's a organisation called Time Banking UK, um, and there's a few few examples. I know there's one that that happens in a women's prison. Um, and it's just a really empowering way of of sharing that doesn't involve money. So that's, that's really valuable. To yeah, really out there. Thank you. Broadening out the the conversation from from the haves and have nots of money. Yeah, and that's uh, very much in the keeping of uh, the theology of heart edge as well. That we work with our assets, not our deficits. You know, whatever those whatever that is, everyone has something to contribute. Um, is there anything that uh, our panelists, you know, is burning to you're burning to say on your heart? You no need to. You 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 fed us an abundant feast today. I'm going to dwell on all that you've shared uh, a huge amount. But is there anything that um, you would wish to say just at the end? Uh, Rachel has her. I know we've we've spoken to Rachel with her hand. Yeah, hands down. Um, um, I'd, I'd just like to say, Catherine, that um, social media is a really powerful um, vehicle for raising awareness of the issues. And um, a number of friends who are outside the church who have no real understanding at all um, have been reading posts that have been read. So, you know, do follow the Reset the Debt campaign, do follow the JPIT Facebook page and do share because it's a way of spreading um, the, the real stories of what's happening. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, can I, um, I'm going to end with a prayer, but if, if I could just thank uh, from the bottom of our hearts, Hannah, for bringing together such an engaging panel and for to you Bev uh, for, give, for being here and to Paul, Mike and Cassius thank you very much indeed and to each one of you who who has, has engaged and contributed to this discussion and, and to the people that will listen afterwards um, let us pray let us act let us remember that next Friday it should be in our diaries um, for um, prayer and action um, and do take, do tell stories, do take this to your local communities. Um, we live in a beautiful and interconnected world and, and, and we must share this burden as, as our panellists have, um, have articulated so beautifully. Um, so could I just end with a prayer? That would be, that would be great. Thank you. Gracious God, thank you for this time together. Thank you for our panellists. And we do lift up to you now those uh, people who are most particularly affected by debt. Um, of course, that is all of us. 
because we are interconnected and we um we must share this burden together lord may you help in finding compassionate responses may you act through our government through our actions through our compassion to reach out to those who are most marginalized all those affected by the pandemic emotionally physically financially and through any form of uh, lack of job pray for this campaign and i give thanks for all those who have taken part this afternoon in jesus name we pray amen amen lovely many thanks <laughs>